Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 5, where today I'm talking to the designers. I'm speaking with Fulton favorites, lighting designer Paul Black, set designer Robert Kovach, and costume designer Ryan Muller. Combined, the three of them have done over 75 productions for the Fulton, and each of them have a long collaborative history with executive artistic producer Mark Robin. Some highlights of their time here have been Hunchback of Notre Dame, Treasure Island, Mamma Mia, Chicago, The Wizard of Oz, and Sunset Boulevard, to name a few. A lot of people don't realize that the designer's process is very different from the actors. The actors usually rehearse about two and a half weeks before we go into tech. The designers show up about three days before we start tech. And tech is when we add the lights, we add the costumes, the set design is finished and all put together. We have four days to do that, and at the end of the fourth day, we put it in front of an audience. So these designers have to show up prepared and work quickly as collaborators to make the final product. We're diving in today to talk about their process as designers and get some inside information of what it's like getting their idea from their brain to a reality on the stage. So sit back and enjoy Robert, Paul, and Ryan. Hi guys, welcome to episode five of Joey's Java Talk, where we're talking to the Fulton favorite designers. I'm joined by Robert Kovach, Paul Black, and Ryan Mahler. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. Thank you for uh, taking time and being with us today and talking about your careers and what you do at the Fulton. Uh, so to kick it off, I'm going to put this out there. I'd love for you all to tell us a little bit about your backgrounds uh, as designers and how it led to working with Mark Robin and the Fulton over the years. So uh, go, go for it. Paul, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I've, uh, I've been designing for, gosh, over 35 years. And uh, I was uh, designing in Phoenix. I live in Phoenix still. But um, there was a director and I was working for him in Phoenix and he brought his uh, choreographer. The director was named Gary Griffin and the choreographer was a young, new choreographer from Chicago. And uh, that was Mark Robin. And that was 30 years ago. Right. And uh, we, the funny thing was is that I never got to work with him. Um, I was working with Michael Mitchell, who became the artistic director at the Fulton, and yeah. I was his designer. Uh, and I worked with Gary Griffin, who Mark uh, was choreographing for. But Mark and I became friends. And uh, when Michael took over the Fulton, one of the first shows he did was Joseph, the first time the Fulton did it. And Mark directed. And uh, he asked me, uh, he, at that point, we had known each other, but we hadn't worked together. And he was, he said, I want to work with Paul. And so I got to come out and we did Joseph. And since then I've been doing shows at the Fulton, which is my favorite theater. Yeah. So Mark and I go way back. And then Mark was very kind when he was freelancing before he's the artistic director. Um, we worked in uh, all over, including the Carousel Dinner Theater in Ohio, where he said, I have this new great designer I want you to work with, which is Robert. Yeah. So, and this is all ancient history. I mean, right. we've worked together a long time. What was the first show you guys did together, you and Robert? Uh, I was it was Cats. Cats. It was Cats yeah. was, oh yeah, I think you were in as well. In that show, yeah, that was my first Carousel time there. Dinner theater. <laughs> Lots of tires. <laughs> <laughs> that's because we got firestone i remember that we were like i went to goodyear and firestone in akron ohio and they sponsored the show i mean we yes, had a we yeah said, it was uh, we cool. said the junkyard was a tire old tire factory uh robert tell us a little bit about uh, uh your your background and and how you made your way to the Fulton. um started out as um uh, just went to grad school for production design ended up working in chicago at um uh, second largest scenic house there, Chicago Scenic Studios. Um, um, my boss was uh, Tom Ryan, who was the resident scenic designer at Merritt Lincolnshire, and that turned into meeting Mark. Um, needed a, a designer down at, um, I was assisting Angie Weber at the time, and unfortunately she couldn't do the show. Mark's first directing job was with her, and then we met, and I think that was 99 or 2000 down in Munster, Indiana, and that was our first show. We met and we hit it off right away, and since then, 
I want to say 50, 60 shows later over the years, all over the place. Yeah. Just awesome. He's an amazing man. And I mean, you could see, you could tell that for the Fulton and the people sitting here on the screen, you know, yeah. I mean, just the love, the loyalty is, it's really nice. And that's the history. I don't want to go through everything, but you name the theater, Paul and I've worked there, Ryan and I from all over from East coast, West coast, the Midwest. And that's how we got to start. I mean, I appreciate Mark giving me that start. And from there we did, you know, in Chicago, we started do really doing kids shows, you know, we did, I don't know how many kids shows we did there, as, especially as me as a young designer and working our way up to, you know, from Chicago Shakes to you name it, to Beef and Boards, to the Carousel, to Fulton, Walnut Street, you name it, Main State, all over the place. So it's, it's, it's a fabulous journey over the years and just a very appreciative. He's a great guy. And, and then uh, just our career ourselves, I think all of us, those opportunities, you know, you start out young anywhere in any job somebody has to give you that first you know that first to say hey I'm, co I'm confident in you you know and and to give you that leaping stone and you take it and then roll with it and it just the doors start opening so it's great ryan your uh your history i did my undergrad work in rockford illinois uh under jeff hendry who's another popular costume designer at the fulton and Jeff was Mark's resident designer at the Drury Lane uh, in Chicago. So when Jeff would design for him, he would use the students as his assistants. And I met Mark doing that through Jeff uh, sometime around 97, 98 as a young undergrad college student uh, through Jeff. Um, and then uh, our careers sort of went in different directions. I went to grad school and everything. And then Jeff was doing uh, The Music Man up at Main State Music Theater and asked me to come up uh, and help build hats one weekend. So I went up there and walking through the costume shop was Kurt and Mark 20 years later. Uh, and it was a sort of a strange family reunion. We sort of stopped and went, don't I know you? Why do I know you? And from there, our friendship was reconnected and we found each other again and it was fantastic. And the next season he called me uh, asking if I would come to the Fulton to design Legally Blonde. And that was my first show at the Fulton. Uh, awesome, you guys, you really are. I mean, it, it, anyone that knows Mark knows that, you know, if you work with him maybe more than two or three times, you're definitely, you know, part of a family and you're going to continue to be asked to, uh, to work with him. Um, uh, I've asked questions, I've asked this question to others about their process, but where do you guys, where do you begin brainstorming when you know you're going to do a show? Like, what, what do you start with uh, as designers? <clears throat> well, first, I mean, first, I, I think all of us read the script. And I just have to say, it's just brainstorming. I mean, sitting down as a team or with the director and you throw stuff on the wall, you know, come up with some ideas and, and, and see what sticks. A lot of times, the directors, Mark or anyone, some come with ideas already, say, hey, I, I see X, I see Y, or I see Z. I, I, or I, like you were saying, a tire factory, you know, you could do it for the cats, you could do it at a junkyard, you do an amusement park. We've seen it in circuses. It's pick your concept and then build that, that, that storytelling around that. So I really starts with just creative ideas, just, just setting down and, and coming up with, with ideas that, that, that tailor the script and, and, and for good storytelling. I think I, I always start with the script again. I read it a couple of times um, and, and directors always have, have ideas or visions that they usually come with, but I, I try and at least come to a meeting with some ideas. Um, you know, even if they all get tossed and nothing goes there, um, you know, good directing is good editing. And if I don't bring them something to edit, then, yeah. you know, so uh, I always try and read the script and have at least an idea when I come in. Um, and I, I find it's interesting. I don't get my best ideas sitting, staring at the computer. I get my best ideas uh, walking the dog, getting out, the shower. Getting the shower. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I gotta go away. And and in order to get those ideas, though, you asked where they come from. Um, I love art. I love seeing theater. I love seeing stuff. So the more I see, and and as you know, even art museums, things that have nothing to do with theater. Um, then as I'm walking or thinking about the script, something will remind me and I'll refer, refer back to that. Sure. And then it's a conversation. That's the fun part yeah. is, is um, you know, there's, in Hamilton, there's the song In the Room Where It Happened. Uh, that's one of the joys is the three of us and Mark <laughs> being in a room and, and, and talking about it. When it finally all, all comes together, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I remember when we were getting ready for Beauty and the Beast that there was a big meeting in his office with all of us sitting around on the couch. And it was maybe two hours, hour and a half or so. And it was just throwing ideas at each other. And this is the idea that I'm looking for. And this is the impact that it's supposed to have. And I remember in particular talking about Belle's gold dresses, that this needs to be little girl, every little girl's fantasy princess come to life. So I started looking at well, first, I, I also read the script, I have to confess. Um, <laughs> but I looked at the source material where it came from, and I went back to the original French fairy tale and looked at the text. And then I looked at different movie versions of it to see what that perfect fairy tale princess dress is. Yeah. Um, looking at children's books was actually really helpful for that one because we wanted it to have this sort of storybook uh, feeling come to life. So I went to the library and I just picked out a lot of Grimm's fairy tales and really beautifully illustrated children's books. And that was where I started my research for that. And then everything sort of developed and built out of that. And the color palette came out of that and talking with set and lights and props and what this world was going to look like. Yeah. I find that oftentimes we go back to source material. So uh, when Rob, we were working on Wizard of Oz, and you think Wizard of Oz, you think the MGM movie. Uh, and Robert, Mark came and Robert came in with uh, drawings from the original, uh, the, the books, the original mm -hmm. books. Um, I think, and you were in that. I've and, done both of those with you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but the very first time we did it, we, you know, Robert came in with, let's look at, at these illustrations, which were the original books. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the, you know, so sometimes, well, a lot of that we go back to, we try and figure out where did this piece come from and go back right. and take a look at that. Especially with a show like The Wizard of Oz, you, you, there's no way you're going to recreate that film on stage. So it's, but I think you two did an amazing job with that design because it, it still made, they paid homage to the film, but it wasn't like, here, let me see if I can build Emerald City to look exactly like the movie. So that's a tribute, a tribute to, to you guys. Well, I think we're, we're always trying to be really careful not to, uh, we don't want to do what's been done. We want to come up with a new idea. Um, sure. But you have to be careful because every time you see something, you're influenced by it. Yeah. That's yeah. a good example. It's funny. We were, we were uh, I was up in, um, we were at Main State, I think it was last summer. And one of the students came up when we were doing Wizard of Oz and said, oh, my professor did a, the, the little roller brick road that curled like a ribbon and had that just like, it. I was like, oh, really? And then she, and she was just like, yeah, let me show you a picture. I saw it. I was like, Wow, and I say it looks really good. It looks very close to this. She's yeah. like, yeah. She's like, um, uh, my professor came up with the idea. It's like awesome. I was like, when did you do the show? She said uh, last year. I started laughing. I was like, do you realize this is the fourth time we've did this, and the first time was two thousand, I think four or three. I told her. She's like, oh, th it was like that look, like oh, shit. <laughs> uh, it might be different. It looks great though, right? Uh, it might be different for each of you, but how far in advance uh, do you start working on a show? You know, is it uh, different? I mean, I'm sure it is different for each of you, but is there a time frame that you, you need or you, you know, you hope you have? I have to say on my side, we all start kind of earlier. And I think Ryan, probably the same way, because of what we have to do, we have to build everything, you yeah. know, costume wise and set wise. And I'll let Ryan take it over. But I mean, it could be on... You know, you need to at least give eight weeks, three, six weeks, possibly, if you're really rushing it on our side to build. And then you have to back out just how fast you can you come up with design drawings. I mean, I'm not going to say that people haven't called me when I t literally say, they say, we should have started building this week, but we lost X, Y, and Z, a director or a designer. Can we, you know, can we get this worked out and, and, you know, in a week? And it just takes a lot of, like, phone calls, you know, just sending stuff quickly out to turn around. But, yeah, I mean, I've, I've did things as fast as eight weeks. You know, in six weeks has been the, the le you know, scary, but that's been the six week time and the shops just have to build. But most of the time it's good to have like anywhere from four to six months is, is awesome. And Ryan, you can go ahead. Uh, I've started working on next season. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, because the set is uh, a, a, a unit, usually you have the Prasini March, it's confined to a space. Yeah. The pieces move, but you have a space. The amount of actors change, co changing costumes is astronomical sometimes. Uh, so I've already started working on next season. I'm rereading Gaston LaRue's The Phantom of the Opera to get in that headspace for that. Uh, in the case of Beauty and the Beast, going back to that, I think I worked almost 10 months to get oh, Beauty wow. and the Beast up. From the day that I was offered the job, which was still Legally Blonde wasn't even open yet, and I had been asked to design Beauty, 
I started reading and researching that and we built that entire show from scratch. So I really needed mm -hmm. that long a time to do the research, come up with the sketches, find the fabric, uh, make the patterns, find people to sew them together, do the fittings, do the painting, the hats, all of that stuff. Yeah. So I, I tend to work long and as far in advance as I can. As soon as I have the job, I start reading the script. And, and I've, I've been witness to it. Sometimes you're, you're literally stitching on opening night with five, <laughs> 10 minutes before the show starts because it's, that's just the, how it goes, you know? It, it is. With 42nd Street, the show is just enormous. Yeah. It's just a huge show and every dance number is a different costume and is a production number. And that was the poor show where we had costumes made in Spain that were stuck in <laughs> costumes at Charles Ball in Paris and we didn't get them till opening night. I've never been so stressed in my life. Oh my gosh, little, little do the audiences know that w what you all go through uh, before uh, we agree. I'm just curious, for 42nd Street, how many costumes did you have? Oh my gosh, I never counted them. We had 18 girls in the chorus. Yeah. And there yeah. were, oh, I, didn't, I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, it was easily broaching the 200 mark. Wow, that's a lot. By the time we had dames and the number 42nd Street and the finale and the auditions. It, it was and not just costumes, but several pieces with the costume, jewelry pieces, shoes. Jewelry, yeah. hats, shoes, all I love that. hats. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff that goes with it. Right. Um, what do you guys like most about collaborating with other designers? We kind of touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but um, are there also, are there things that are really difficult about collaborating with one another? <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what my favorite thing is, is that um, you're, you're sharing ideas. The, the design at the end, it, when, it's, when it's right, when, it's, when you're really working, it's, it's when you're having fun. And I think some of the best work is when we're all riffing on each other's work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, and, and when you work with designers who, who are a little too precious, they hang on to their ideas a little too much, that's difficult. That's the difficult part about collaborating. But when you're collaborating with these guys, you know, there's no bad ideas and you're working in sort of a safe space, especially with Mark Robin that the, the, you know, when the four of us are together, you sort of feel like you can throw anything out and you then just sort of work off of each other's stuff and you work, you know, a lot of times when I'm doing lights with these guys, it's uh, lights are added last. And part of what I want to do is show off their work as best I can. The, those costumes should not look like a different color than what they look like backstage. <laughs> And that goes with the set too. Yeah. Um, so it, but it's that collaboration and it's being part of that discussion that is for me the best part. The worst part is when you are working with designers uh, and directors who are a little too precious with it. And it, and it's, you know, this is what it's gotta be as opposed to a safe space for a discussion and a conversation, which goes back to your question about time. If, if you have time, then you don't have, you're not stuck with your first idea and everybody can sort of bounce some ideas around. Right. But, um, yeah. there was, uh, when we were doing Chicago, uh, Adam Koch was our set designer and I'll never forget, uh, it was one of the first things we'd started. And you know, that set was kind of, if you just looked at it without lights on it, it was, it was gorgeous. But when you did, you did some light thing and there was haze and he was literally like, oh my God, gosh, thank you. Like, you know, you, you just enhanced what was already amazing uh, to be that much better. Uh, you guys, uh, any other things you want to add? I think yeah. what Paul is, oh, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> Sorry, this is really hard sometimes. Uh, I was <laughs> oh, just gonna good. say, yeah, I, I think that he's right, that uh, I think Paul's correct in that I really enjoy going into a meeting or seeing the set model or seeing the research that someone else has brought in and going, oh my gosh, I love that idea. I'm totally going to use that because that reminds me of X, Y, and Z and that's going to influence how I do this. Yeah. Or knowing what color has been chosen for the set tells me what color the clothes can't be because we don't want them to blend in yeah. and gives me an, a more informed world as to where it is that we live and what, what it is that we're trying to create. And I really love that playing off of everyone else's idea because we all have different experiences. We all have different educations and have yeah. you know, been to different parts of the world or whatever. So we're all bringing something different to the table. And I love that hunger for knowledge and wanting to feed off of each other, I really love. It gets hard, as Paul said, when someone thinks that something is just too precious and they can't let it go. And then it becomes a bigger issue. Yeah. I mean, there are times where you know, you're in the middle of tech 
and all of a sudden, you know, Mark will say, we're, we're going to cut that piece. We're going to cut that set piece or we don't need that. And I mean, I, that's like when, as a performer, when he goes, we're completely cutting these next, you know, 15, eight counts of this huge number that you spent so much time on. So it, but it all is in a, a way to shape the picture to make it as, as, as best as it can be, you know, and you have to trust in, in your director, which um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, Joey, there's been a couple of times where we've been with Mark when Mark has said, we're going to cut this. And Robert and I and Ryan will get together and we'll go over like, give us one more day. We'll make <laughs> <it more." laughs> oh my gosh. Um, like you're saying, Paul, you just have to check your ego at the door. To me, it's like th what we're having right now, this is the conversation and people could see it like around the table. I mean, I know, you know, you're around these video conference calls now, but this is what happens in person. This is the coolest part about it. It's sometimes it's over dinner. Sometimes it's over conference, a conference call. Sometimes it's like you're, you go to dinner after you're, you know, you're, you're meeting a director from doing casting. You meet for 30 minutes or for an hour, goes back cast. You meet him again after dinner. Then you meet him again at the, in the hotel lobby below for another hour, you know, when they're in town. So you're just trying to pack it, but that's the, it's that coolest relationship. And, and checking the, to me, the best thing is like, I don't have the ego, just put it to the side. And it like, if something gets cut, it's, it's sad because sometimes you're like, Oh, it's the depth. But Joey is like exactly what you're saying. It's, you got to have like a leader. Somebody has to take control. It doesn't matter X, Y, and Z, whatever you decide to do, whatever the side to cut, but somebody has to have that final vision that you're supporting. And that's what we do. We support that vision. And if that, that creative vein has to be there because that audience has to come with us on this journey. And if not, I think that's when you go to see a show and you're like, ah, oh, that was a little clunky yeah. there. It felt bouncy is because it could be one of these moments like, Paul and Ryan were saying where somebody gets caught up on something and doesn't want to give it away rather than just saying, you're right, it's not working. Let's, like you said, cut something or change these dance eight counts, whatever it may be. It's all about the flow and keeping people and their energy to level up, especially when we do these big musicals. You, the story has to come across and the excitement has to be there. People are, you know, you're setting for two hours. You got it. It's got to feel like, man, I, I, I just spent X amount of dollars and I feel great. I love that show. Let's come back and see it again. And that's what we do. Pure <laughs> entertainment, you know? It's, I think that goes back to what I was saying, a good directing is good editing. And if we don't, as performers and as designers, we have to bring stuff to the table to allow directors to sort of edit. And, and we have to, you know, I have to come with, I have to not just come with one idea, I have to come with a couple um, to see how it works with everybody. And when you're working with designers you trust, other designers, everybody becomes an editor, you know? Um, and you're able to have those fun conversations. And that's a good thing on the lighting side, like Ryan and I, it, you might be able to change a hat or shoes, maybe a costume or two, but you just can't come in at that point and say, I need 20 new costumes. That, yeah. I've never, I mean, it just can't happen. And the same thing with the scenery. Sometimes you can, maybe we repaint it a little bit, but a lot of times it's like, okay, maybe we play it on an angle or if it doesn't, if it's yeah. not working for the staging, maybe we do cut it. Maybe we can't get it on and off stage as fast as we thought we could, you mm -hmm. know, or the quick change took a little longer and now you have to pick, you know, you pick your battles. Like, is it the set piece or the costume change? What, what is going to keep this story flowing? And like Paul was saying, edit is the key there. And a lot of times we look to lighting designers to help us with that. It's like, okay, we don't have a lot of scenery up here or the director put a lot of, say, down in the N1 left or down in the N1 right. Like, okay, let's darken that. Let's do a shafts of light. Let's turn on the star drop. What's that? You know, it's creating those visual pieces or silhouetting an actor over here to help fill these voids just to, you give that illusion, but at the same time, pulling focus where it needs to be for storytelling wise. Editing, I guess. Right. Paul, I'm going to say, do you need to um, scoot out or you, can you stick with us a little longer? I can stick with for just a little bit more. All right, I'm going to I'm gonna jump back in. Um, well, I'm going to ask, um, some, uh, what do you think are some of the major uh, inno technical advancements, uh, innovations in, uh, in your world since you started? Um, what's, 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 hap what's the biggest thing do you think uh, has changed most for you guys as designers? I guess this is more maybe Paul question. Well, when I, when I, started, <laughs> when I started doing lighting, um, the, one of my very first designs was done on the very first computerized light board. So uh, when I was in college, we were still using, you know, manual boards and one of the first designs, the first design on Broadway to use a computerized light board was a uh, chorus line, which is one of the reasons that show looked like it looked. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my lifetime there, I've seen the technology go through multiple phases, but the biggest techno technological change, I guess, would have been the computer, but now lately it's LED. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's the fact that we're able to change color and not have the heat has totally changed the um, my world uh, lately. But you watch it go, I've watched it go through waves and it and, and stuff changes. And because theater doesn't typically have the big bucks, the research dollars for lighting often come out of rock and roll. Uh, the moving light that moves when you see lights move was uh, that came out of money that Phil, Co the original moving light came out of money that Phil Collin put up for research yeah. to a company in Texas called Verilight. Um, so now theater has used those lights, yeah. but you find that technology, we find things in other industries and suck them into our world. Um, and as a designers, I know that I'm always keeping my eye on other industries to say, oh, what are they doing that's interesting? How can I co-opt that into our world? Totally. I'll never forget cats at Carousel, like sitting down during tech and being like, I feel like I'm in a rock show. <laughs> like your design was insane. It was so crazy. Um, uh, you got Robert, uh, Ryan, anything that you think's really changed for you in your industries? Uh, I think the 3D printer has actually come a long way in helping my industry because you are able to take uh, an object, uh, a belt buckle, let's say, a vintage belt, belt buckle from the 1880s or something, and you can digitally scan it and have it printed out and recreate it for much cheaper. Uh, and if you're doing a long running show, you can have backups or you can have it for understudies and swings or make multiples of them for hats and things like that. Um, so I think that's the biggest, uh, I mean, aside from the sewing machine, I suppose. We have a 3D printer now at the Fulton. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. We do. We I do. usually call props and go, can you do this? Can you make one of these? Right. So that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, Robert, anything in your, in your world? Technology. I, I, that, it's just the advancement of technology and computer programs have just made what we do and what I do in particular more efficient, quicker, um, being pro more productive, that's the best way I can describe it. There's no way that when I first started out in grad school learning on AutoCAD, a DOS version where you had to type in like line, L-I-N-E, you had to type in every single command, you know, yeah. Yeah, it, for the program itself. And today, for how much we're on the move as designers and our, our time span, as you were, it leads back to your first question about time. And Ryan say nine months, I have to say, when I first started, we, you would be hired a year in, a, in advance but, and then you'd start kind of right away. Sometimes it was a year and a half. Now it's like, you may be asked, you know, the summer before, the fall before to do a show, but on my world, sometimes the directors aren't available. Sometimes the other teams aren't available to start chatting. And when I say it's like four months out, five months out, it's, it's the time frame has just gotten a lot shorter. And the only way that that's helped is, is, is the technology. You're not able to the hand drafting anymore because you'd have to be at a particular place with a drafting board which is where I started now it's like you can take your laptop and draft a show anywhere you can even do the hand sketches and transform them you know portable scanner that I have that's this big just scoot it just digital it in there's I guess in my point there's no way my av well before this whole thing happened here I mean 30 plus uh special events that that I would do a year that Without that, there's no way because you couldn't just be in the office and work. You had to, you have to be able to challenge yourself to be mobile, and the technology allows that. From being able to integrate a hand sketch and and, and taking out a PDF, say if you drew something in AutoCAD into Photoshop, and be able to hand paint it, and you create these templates like over time, you know, you're yeah. saying, hey, here's a gouache I had, here's a paint, you know, samples, and I literally went through and created like hundreds of these that I scanned, and now it's like you could pull up a template but instead of having to repaint something, you can say, okay. I, I know I have this color wash of this brick texture. You can just grab it and on the road and you don't have to worry about having your paints or your markers or your pens yeah. with you. You have it in, in, you can bring it into your palettes and have it in, in, in Photoshop and go to town painting elevations that look like they're hand painted. The technology is just phenomenal today. Um, and, and, and just learning that is key. Um, and it's not just one program. I mean, you know, being able to do three to four programs efficiently, you can really, in the sense of cranking things out, like I was saying before, like, uh, a, a, the theater, a, a theater in your town um, uh, really close to you called me and, and last year. And when I tell you it was very last minute, within four days, we had to have a design. And it was like, and like Paul was saying, it was literally the first idea. It was like, 
talk, talk, talk. No, no, no. Talk, talk, talk. Okay. Go to town. And the shop just was like emailing every day, calling, do you have anything? Do you have any? And we were literally, as we were doing the sketches, yep. Approve that. We did the storyboards really quickly and they were building it as, as I draft a piece, boom, they build it, draft wow. a piece because it was that quick. Uh, you know, people dropped out, unfortunately, last minute, and they thought they had stuff getting done, but they didn't, you know, doing things. So without that technology, there's no way. It just, just can't happen. Um, you guys have been involved in so many productions at the Fulton. Are there things here that stand out for you as like, you know, amazing experiences or your proudest work? There are some things that uh, you stand by as, gosh, that was a really great one. I really enjoyed the experience on Treasure Island. Um, I generally, as a designer, gravitate toward big, lavish, period inspired uh, shows, Beauty and the Beast, for example. Uh, and Treasure Island was such an amazing experience. To do an original work, first off, is always gratifying because you're not following in the footsteps of someone necessarily. You, you get to set the precedent for what this show becomes and what the legacy of this show becomes. Um, and also it was a cast of 36 men, which was so rewarding as a designer that you could really, menswear is not super exciting, generally speaking, <laughs> in the industry. So to have this cast of characters and the pirates were all extremely specific. They all had a name. All of the sailors had a name, which me as a designer tells me that those people have to have personalities. Mm -hmm. So to look at their history and look at uh, where in the world they could have come from and what their history is and what their fashion would have been inspired by and what fabrics are masculine and what makes these, what makes this guy taller and this guy bigger and this guy scarier or whatever, whatever. You know, the one guy's covered all in tattoos. Uh, it was a really rewarding experience because I've never done anything like that. And it is easily one of my top two favorite shows still in my portfolio. I just love that experience so much. Yeah, I, I, Joey, I would say that uh, uh, the many shows I've done, my most memorable ones have been at the Fulton. Um, and Treasure Island, certainly on the top of that list. Uh, a lot of it because we created it from scratch. But I would also have to say that uh, the Hunchback that we did uh, was really exciting lighting wise and uh, and the Wizard of Oz that we that we did at the Fulton. Um, but uh, the shows that I remember, yeah, there's, there's the, the when I look back at, at, think about shows, the ones that I really remember and stand out oftentimes are, Ful are Fulton shows. Robert? I, with Mark, I had to say, I, all of them are just, because they're just different in the sense of like, you know, you're not like, oh, hey, they did this before. Can we do something similar? And you're like, no, I really don't want to go down that route. With Mark, it's, it's, the ideas are just open. I don't know how to say it other than that. I mean, from look at our Annie, for example. Look at those translucent drops, those costumes. I'm just beautiful. Like being able to back like that, it looks stunning. Uh, Peter Pan, again, I mean, we did that a couple, I don't even know how many times now. A lot. Yeah, right. A lot of that. But, you know, in Wizard of Oz, it's like you look at that and it's like, it's not like a favorite. It's you're looking at it going, wow, this is, we do good. Like, how do you not, like, how do you top yourself? But at the same time, they're just beautiful shows. The sure. story's great. And you look at it color wise, even our Joseph. I mean, again, that we had a limited great. budget on that one, but how, what we created was that, that step pyramid and those, that the light. LED light boxes. So crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was stellar from King and I, you name it. It's just, yeah. I can I could keep naming them. It's just like, I mean, those. Are, um, if you ask my favorite, those would probably be the top five. Those are just they rock. I mean, they're just really beautifully designed shows, lighting wise, costume wise, but really well thought out dance wise, choreography wise, storytelling. Tell, when you go there, they were shows that you were like, you felt something. It wasn't just about energy, you know, like, oh, it's a bubblegum musical. It's, it was like, oh, I, I get the story of Annie. I, you felt for her, you felt for that character. And that's what you want to do when you come yeah. see a show. I would say that, Go ahead. I would say that my favorite shows at the Fulton are ones that are not just necessarily great lights or great sets or great costumes. They're, they're the shows that we come away that we really, that it paid off and it all pulls together. And it's not just our department, it's choreography, it's direction, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, all of it. And, 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 and you know when that works and we've seen it and it and what it does is it makes an audience feel you feel something when you leave the theater and i'm often proud of the design work we do but i'm more proud of of the message and the shows for sure and that tailors back to the actors i mean again we're creating this this space right this environment doesn't matter if you, you can't the actors don't really see the lights right 
other than being blinded most of the time, right? <laughs> when they start hearing an audience that cheer, that driving enthusiasm, that that Paul's being able to pull and focus a, a, a focus into an area that draws that attention to demand that applause, that standing motivation, that helps that. Same thing with the costume. Like if they're well fitted, you know, everybody's body is different. Some people yeah. are wide, at the, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, being able to fit them so that they look stellar on stage. And then at the same time, being able to light them that way. And then providing this scenic background or something that basically doesn't absorb them. They pop off the background. All of that is like that visual in the back of our heads that as an audience goer, you don't, you, they take it for granted. But yeah. what happens is, is like, oh, wow, they go, oh, that's awesome. And that gives them that, goes straight to that applause or that standing ovation or that feeling of like, wow, I, you know, you just, just helping that actor in the sense reach that character that they're they're that they've developed through rehearsals and now it's on stage and that's it. I mean, I don't know how to say it. And Joey, you could jump in there, but that's- you No, know, I mean, as an actor too, there's, there are those moments when I, I, I know I've known Robert and Paul for, you know, 15 years now and Ryan, you know, the past couple of years, but there are those times where you go out on stage and I am so, as a performer, I'm so proud of, of you, of your work and it's, it, it really does inform what happens to us as people on stage as well. The environments that you create, oh, or, yeah. you know, the costumes we get to wear. It, it it's it's just an amazing uh, process, and um, I just I did I wanted to feature you guys because you know you work you do so much behind the scenes, and I and you don't always get to talk about what you do. So I I really wanted to feature you all in this uh, series because it, you guys you. bring so much magic and love and everything your passion to, to, to this building so um one more i want to ask you well guys one more joey i gotta i gotta jump over to this other call you gotta go paul I gotta go. Question. take the question paul hurry hurry <laughs> <laughs> uh real quick paul yes one, one show you really want to do one 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 that you haven't checked off of your list yet that you still you still have that you want to work on one show that i want to work on <laughs> um I've never lit Superstar. I've assisted on Superstar, but I've never lit it. I've oh, never done it or done the set for it. Well, we want to do it so badly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's false. All right, thanks, guys. Oh, love you. Bye, love thanks you guys. for joining us today. All right, there goes Paul. Uh, all right, so the, the last two standing. Uh, your 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 shows you still want to do. You or me? Go. I would go, I, to me, which we'll probably never see in our lifetimes, but it's the two big Broadway ones. I mean, if, they, if they're that, it's the Wicked or the Lion Kings. Those are, I mean, I don't know. They're just, I would yeah. love to be able to take a different spin just to see, again, especially and, and at the Fulton and, and having Mark allowing that to happen, to take a different spin, especially Wicked. Like, this, yeah. it's already really just, so theatrical so the, the gates and the monkey how again i don't say we're not changing the story it's just how do we reconceive the environment that they live in and still tell the same story that i think it would be a challenge and i would that's what i would love one of those two yeah i, I think to add to that that is one of the, the things that we pride ourselves on here and mark does as well is that if we're like for instance like a show like chicago everybody when we went to new york to cast that show every dancer came in that room wearing black and we were like, well, you're not doing that show, <laughs> you know? Because why would you want to come see us do a, a remount of that production that's been on Broadway for 20 years, you know? I think it's, uh, it's amazing to, if you're going to pick a show like those, you know, to, to, to bring something new to the, to the table. So, yeah, right. When we were actually working on Chicago, that was the first thing that Mark told me was no black underwear. This is not that show. No, we're no. going back to the original. It is a burlesque and each number is its own music styli stylistically. So it needs to have its own feeling stylistically. So there was a pink number and there was the feather number and there was a sequin number and there was a fringe number and everything was its own. But yeah, I saw all of those people coming in that first day of rehearsal, black underwear, <laughs> hair pulled back. <laughs> Not, Not my show. Uh, but Ryan, a show you still want to tackle. What's something you want to do? I have a couple on my bucket list still, but I have to say at the top is a little night music oh. because it is, that is my sweet spot as a designer. Yeah. Rich people turn <laughs> the century and just close for <laughs> days. Yes. Uh, so a little night music and Into the Woods is my other one. I've never done an Into the Woods and I love fairy tales. So you want to land in the Sondheim world. <laughs> I, I, I like the Sondheim world, yeah. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, you guys, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do. I, I want to say again, thank you for taking time and speaking to, uh, to me today and to the Fulton audiences uh, and beyond um, um, sharing your passion and what you do. So we and if it wasn't you for and... them, Joey, that's, I mean, again, like you said, it's the Fulton audience. If it wasn't for them, we, we wouldn't be here today delivering this message and, and having those, those individuals that support us and that support the arts in general. I mean, the Fulton itself is an amazing place just from the time that I started working there. And Joey, you could see the same thing. The transformation by Mark oh, is yeah. phenomenal. Just the gratitude, not just with the patrons, but the people he brings in. I mean, everybody is just grateful. I mean, just, just the whole, the kinky books in general. I mean, just seeing that, the cast and the crew and then the design team, still, you know, before the whole, until May, you know, excited about talking about it every week, working on this all the way up during being closed until August, until we pushed to May. I mean, that that is, that that passion you just can't buy. I don't know how to say it other than that. It's because you're delivering it for audiences and then and and the great people you work with. And 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 it starts at the top and that's starting out with the leader with Mark and coming down from there. So it's phenomenal. It's good. Well I hope you guys uh stay safe and healthy where you're at and Ryan good luck with your move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you our audiences will see you guys back uh, uh for Kinky Boots uh where we where we left off in in May. So right. right. Uh, Stay safe uh, and uh, okay. we'll talk to you guys soon, okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. So that's it for today. I want to say thank you to Robert, Ryan, and Paul, although he left us a little early, for joining us and talking about their careers as designers. Tune in next week for episode six, where we feature the unsung heroes of the theater business. I'll be speaking with Fulton stage and company management teams, which include Tim Marcus, Becca Church, Domingo Manquello, and Buddy Reader. Thanks guys for joining us today, and we'll see you next week.